Oh, shalom, my friends, and yee This is your old pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And I'm thrilled and delighted and excited and honored that we have a person who was inducted into the Australian Songwriter Hall of Fame, my friends. And why did this happen? Because for years he wrote or co-wrote wonderful songs for a band he was in. You may have heard of it. They were sort of internationally popular with songs like What You Need and uh, Listen Like Thieves and one of my very favorite songs of the era, Bar None, this time, which was written by this man, Andrew Farris, when he was in the band called In Excess. But now we're, we're, we're scaling back the excess and we're bringing it home. We're bringing it country because he has a new album out. It's his first solo album. He's named it after him, which I think shows a little bit of a lack of imagination. But still, ladies and gentlemen, won't you please welcome to the neighborhood and give a big Aussie shalom to Andrew Farris. Shalom, Andrew. Ah, hello, shalom. How are you, sir? I am delightful and delighted to be here. And how are you? I'm above ground and I'm happy. You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, you should uh, have me stuffed and hang me on the wall. You know, uh, as a happy man. No, seriously, no, I'm I'm really good, and I thank you for having me on your show. And yeah, um, I, I'm just so far so good. I've had a really good reaction to my record that I've put out, and it's like country and western uh sort of theme that i've got on my record and so far so good well no, thank god now here's here's the question because people would think okay i we listened to nxs all those years ago as pop uh with a edge of rock to it it certainly almost never went in a country western direction you're from australia how on earth did the twain meet okay well just bear with me for a minute because I'll, I'll explain all this okay Please. so I was a main songwriter, you know, uh, along with Michael Hutchinson, but he, uh, sadly, you know, he passed away a long time ago now. Well, I keep writing songs. I'm a songwriter. I always was, always will be. Been writing songs since I was a teenager. And as I was writing these songs, sometimes for the work that I was doing for In Excess in, in the old days, uh, some of these songs didn't really suit the band, but didn't mean I didn't like the songs or they couldn't be useful. So I just shelved them. And more recently, I started getting quite, prolific again with my writing i just i, I love songwriting again and um and so i started re-recording my older demos and the newer demos that i had the newer songs and uh, i was tracking them both uh at my farm i live about seven hours inland from the coast in australia i guess what you might call the outback okay uh and i actually have cattle and grains uh when it rains i have a, a big you know big farm and I, in that sense, I really am a cowboy. I'm not messing around with that. I, I've actually worked with cattle for many years, and I, that's part of what I do in my life. Anyway, you kill them in a kosher way. In, Say yes, but if it's not true. Kosher. Yes. Good. Yes. Good. 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 Yes. All right. Yes. So, 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 good so the cowboy thing is not that alien to you. You live the life, and of course, musically, pop developed on some level out of country music. There was rockabilly first, and then it. it so there, there is a connection, and yet you chose to go full shall we say full hog or full cow with this album. And the look of it is Old West. Uh, some of the songs are, are Old Westy themes, in right. American speaking. Right, right. Well, let me explain more. So uh, thank you, Saul. Can I call you Saul? Oh, of course you may. All right. May, may I call you Andrew? I'm sorry, I called you Andrew before asking. May I call you Andrew? You can call me Andrew. Just don't call me a dickhead. We'll be good. No, I certainly would never do that. Never, never. People have called me that. You don't want to know. People call me worse. But please, you're explaining the, the genesis of this new album. Uh, okay. So, well, here we go. Here we go. Okay. So, uh, I started re-recording these songs that I'd written, you know, from a long time ago and some very recently. And uh, I was both doing it in Australia, my farm, and also in Nashville, because my wife, Marlena, she's from Dayton in Ohio. So we, it was only five hours for us to drive down Highway 75 to Nashville. And we have friends down there and I have, you know, kind of, uh, what's a professional songwriting buddies as well that I go work with there, girls and guys. Anyway, and I took a trip one time to Nashville to do this. And then Marlena and I decided to go on a horse riding holiday 
down on the Mexican border. And uh, I wasn't actually thinking so much of, of making my own album up to that point. I was just making my demos and my songs that I was writing sound better. You know, I was re-recording them. When I got down to the Chiricahua Mountains, where uh, the Mexican border and New Mexico and Arizona, right there, they, where, that, where they meet is the Chiricahua Mountain area. I got an education from a cowboy uh, uh, called Craig Lawson. And uh, he and his wife, Tam, uh, I think she's part Cherokee Indian, I think. Well, anyway, so that uh, Craig has sadly passed away, but he gave me an education uh, of the uh, this wilderness area where we were riding horses. Well, we were riding horses for six hours a day, six days straight. Your took and is to hurt like, oh my God, I can't imagine. Well, you're used to it, but I can't for well, 10 minutes. Yeah, I mean, I... I am a cowboy, so I get it, you know, and so anyway, so here's the thing. So I'm riding around with, with uh, Craig, who was my teacher, if you like, uh, my educator, and we're riding through this wilderness area. And I was suddenly struck with the gritty, dusty, you know, wilderness area, the, the, the reality of it began to kick in with me. Uh, you had the Apache Indians. Uh, there. Um, you had um, the U.S. Cavalry. You had the Mexican people, of course, just across the border. And then in the old days, you had the Mexican Army. And then up the road, you got um, Tombstone. And then you had the, the Cowboys and you have the Outlaws and the Settlers, you know. And suddenly it, it turned from being a Hollywood film fantasy to a gritty experience where I could literally see these canyons that Craig rode us into where you could see the stagecoach route still in the ground. There's no like vehicle, modern vehicle tracks or anything. And you could see abandoned silver mines. We went to abandoned US cavalry forts. We actually, I know the place where Geronimo surrendered. Uh, I know where, very sadly, I can, I know the tombstone area where his grandson is buried. Uh, we rode our horses up to the Cochise's stronghold. And I could see how the US cavalry would try to ride across to catch Coach East, but they never could because he was one step ahead of them because he could see him coming. Well, the point of all this is the songwriter part of me kicked in, you see. And I'm going, what's this place? You know, this is not a movie. This is all real, you know. And you, we went through Apache Pass. You dismount off your horse and you lean down. There's still bullets on the ground. You know, it's like that kind of place, you know. And... And I'm thinking, this is all pretty, pretty, pretty amazing stuff. And when I get back to Nashville, I get in the room, as they say, when you do these songwriting things. And I think people were like, maybe thought I'd lost my mind, which is quite, quite possible. Um, Happened to and, me, uh, Happened to all of us. Yeah. But there you go. something and clicked in you. Something was like, I'm, I, there's a whole thematic element to. Exactly. Yeah. And then, and then at that point, I suddenly thought to myself, I know if I was going to make an album, I know what kind of album I want to make now. I get it. I get it because there's a part of Australian culture, believe it or not, that's very similar to this part of US culture where you had the Europeans bring your broad brimmed hats out of Europe and they bought them with, right? They bought them with them, the, the fashions of the day, including the instruments of the day were, 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 were classical instruments like violins, uh, became a fiddle in folk music, both in Australia and the United States and Canada and lots of other places. But, you know, this is what was going on. And, and the upright pianos suddenly found their way into into Deadwood and, and saloons and things. And you had people suddenly creating all this bizarre music that they had. And this is all pre-electricity. You got to keep that in mind. Like it was, this was the old physical frontiers, not today's world, which is electronic frontiers but the old world or physical frontiers. And I suddenly thought, what an amazing landscape to write about. Like, I, I don't know anyone else that's writing about this stuff exactly. So I'll head off down the trail on my own and see what I can come up with. And then I realized, you know, why don't I do, I do everything like this? Why don't I do my videos like this? Why don't I, why don't I do the photography, the, the artwork, actually the physical vinyl on my record right is actually the same thing it's a piece of art from it's very, of, you know 
But yeah. I want to ask you in terms of also the art and the, the look of it, you do have for the single of the album, a very involved and well-produced video. Like, and I'm, I'm wondering just also about like where 20 years after MTV essentially stopped showing videos and now it's all just, it's TV, it's sitcoms, whatever, reality shows. Why do artists still bother, quote unquote, to make music videos? Well, because that's a good question. Um, I'm continuing to do it. I haven't finished yet. I'm doing more of these things. First of all, it's a, a form of art in itself. Um, you know, I was part of a, 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 a very successful reality television show called Rockstar in Excess. And I know what a reality television show is. And I understand all that. Um, but I, before that, in excess as a band was making videos and we used to get mtv awards for them and that kind of stuff but if you ask why would i do it now well you might also ask why would i put out a vinyl album now why would you what put I, believe... I know that's coming back but why um you did an ep last year now you're right. doing full-length record i mean why have a 50 60 minute record when the whole music business is hey oh my hat uh, the whole music business has gone kaflui and you can do whatever you want why did the the idea of still of an album length work okay okay well here here's the thing you're right that a lot of the modern digital platforms and radio would it keeps going back to the 1950s you want to talk about retro it's like the 1950s, almost early 1960s again, where you've got a Tin Pan Alley situation where you've got a bunch of people who are very clever at writing songs and they put them all on the radio. And, and then most of it's about advertising, right? Most of, what, most of what's going on is people trying to sell stuff, right? And yet here we are all these years later and the art form seems to be going away and all we're getting is the advertising part of it. So part of my thinking was, well, why, why, why would I want to do that? I, I, I like the art form of making videos. I like the old school idea of a vinyl album where your whole album tells a story. And I mean, literally where I wanted on my album to have all the lyrics on my album and all the music and all the instrumentation, all the photography, all the videos, everything, the artwork, the vinyl to be a common flow within that within that album, because as an artist, otherwise your career is fractured because, you know, the modern digital platforms and mediums to expose your art form would have you as just another, you know, three minute bit that drops in and out of it. And I said, I don't want to do that. I want to go more into an art area and, and explain to people like yourself, your good self, that the reason I'm doing this is because I like to bring the art back again. Let's get the art back into music again. You know? Can I ask why, I mean, uh, NXS had quote unquote its heyday in the 80s and 90s, and yet 20 something years it took for you to release that. I mean, why didn't you take those demos 15, 20, 25 years ago? Some, some artists, even when they're still in a band, will go off and do a solo project, a George Harrison wonder wall, if you will. Why? Right. Why not you? Okay. I've got two things I want to say here. Okay. First of all, I never really thought it was important to make an Andrew Ferris album. Um, I was very proud of the work that and I still am that I did with in excess. And I miss those guys. They're my friends. Two of them are my, literally my family, brothers. my brother, my yeah. brothers. Right. So I miss those guys, you know, and, um, and, and I hope they're well, you know, God bless them. You know, but to me, you know, when I went to make this record, I, it was, I didn't really know what I wanted to do until that horse riding adventure that I did. And then all the parts seemed to come together in my mind where I, I suddenly realized, don't, Andrew, don't make a pop album, okay? Make a body of work that relates to culture, like, you know, the meetings of cultures, which is the period that I'm writing my music about is, is, is where cultures are, are not clashing so much, but where people are curious about cultures because we've only got one world. We only have one earth. And even though we're all different cultures and we all have different viewpoints and belief systems or whatever it all is, we all have to live together on this planet. And even though we have these bizarre films that tell us that there's, 
you know, there's life in outer space and there's all these other things going on. As far as I can see, when I look out the window right now and I'm looking out there, there's just us humans on this planet. That's all I know. And well, we've got to get on somehow. You know? what, what you're looking out the window of is it that looks more like a car than a tour bus. What are you what are you in right now? What is that? I see a shirt. I, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm sitting in my farm truck oh. because I don't have the technology back at the farmhouse. I live six miles off a sealed road before you get to my front gate. Okay. Like I, I, I seriously, I, I'm not a hobby farmer. Like I'm right into it. Okay. So, you know, that's where I live. I live out in the country, you know, right way out in the country. Um, so I'm sitting in my farm truck in town. So that I've got the internet speed so we can talk to each other on different parts of the world. Now I've got one more part of the story. I want to tell you why I'm okay. I don't know why I feel like this is the time I'm supposed to be doing this. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Years ago in excess, we went to uh, uh, shoot. Well, we were all, always shooting videos, but one of the two videos we shot was for songs called original sin. And the other one was called, I send a message. And those videos were shot in Japan, both in Tokyo. And one was in the old, uh, old, old Buddhist temple. Uh, they made out of the huge old, you know, 2000 3000 year old temple or something in Tokyo. And it, you know, this is incredibly culturally significant, you know, uh, a building had never had Westerners or Gaijin, you know, it's a Japanese word for us in the temple. And uh, so Michael and I were curious as to why us young guys from Australia were led into this uh, very, you know, significant historic building, uh, you know, with a, with a lot of uh, you know, importance to the, the Japanese people. And the head monk comes up to us and he says, I show you why. And he leans down and he picks up a trumpet and he goes, da -da 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 -da, and starts to play the trumpet, right? So the point, the point I'm trying to make is, is that it's not so much he like mariachi music. It's yeah, got more to do yeah, with, right. <laughs> right. It's got more to do with the fact that he he was trying to say to us, you know, there are some languages like music that communicate with everybody, not just somebody over here and somebody over there, you know, and, and I'm, a, I'm a fan of many cultures of music, you know, um, many different nationalities of music. I listen to all kinds of music and not just modern pop or country or whatever i listen to well, let me let me ask you because we don't have a lot of time with you so i want to make okay. every moment count if you had uh, i'm sure you've been asked this your desert island discs and they weren't an accessor or your new album but somebody else's right. what are two di discs that you would take to a desert island okay well first of all i'd need a record player to play them Okay. Yes. All right. That's a guy that's Spotify. Okay, <laughs> fine. Yes. Sorry, I'm just thinking laterally. Anyway, so you know, um, like a controller <laughs> that you could crank. Uh, okay, okay. So if if I had a diesel generator there and I had my vinyl record player plugged into it, and if I had a choice of vinyl record, yeah, I would probably take. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Um, Highway 61 revisited by Bob Dylan. Maybe um, some northern Indian flute music, and I would have a Johnny Cash album of some sort there. Right. Well, if you were on a desert island, you wouldn't want the prison one because that would be too close to home because you'd be stuck Ooh, in prison. Yeah, yeah. It could be one of the, the walk the line later ones. But let me also ask you, and I did want to ask about, since it's one of my favorite uh, songs, the composition, if you remember it, when you were writing and putting together this time, because I just love that. Always have loved that song. So Thank do you, you remember anything Thank about you. it? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I do. Uh, I can remember I wrote that song uh, for NXS's Listen Like Thieves album. And uh, we, uh, well, we had it out as a single for a while, but I actually wrote the song. It's about, um, you know, people in life, You sometimes you get into situations where, you know, you're feeling like you're arguing with somebody or you're, you know, you're fighting with someone about something. And at the end of the day, you know, it doesn't really solve anything to fight, you know, you know, you, you best make peace with people in your time, you know? Yeah. Okay. That, I that's mean, what that's, the song's about. That's yeah. a fabulous sex play. It's very almost religious. As, you know, it mentioned, I read somewhere that NXS was almost approached to be a Christian band at some point. Do you have, is religion uh, part of your life, even uh, now especially, you know, there's certain parable elements in your music? 
yeah, I'm 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 open uh, to most belief systems, so long as they are kind and gentle to people, and then I'm okay with it. Yeah. There's very um, few that actually were in history. You might have to go, go to like Zen or something. All the rest, not always. Not, but but at least in the books, they seem to be nice. That would be. You know. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's like uh, that's like history we're talking about now. Like, for example, you know, I was a fairly voracious reader of, uh, of history, both modern and, and, and older history, especially Romans and the Celts. And, uh, you know, like uh, when Julius Caesar uh, went across to England, you know, it was one of the last places they conquered, you know, um, and, uh, you know, that a lot of people don't realize that the Roman army almost uh, came to permanent grief, trying to land uh, their navy and, and invade England because there was a big storm came up. And, you know, but Julius Caesar, he, he would basically get rid of anyone he didn't like who so he said, I'll write the history, thank you, because he didn't want someone to probably tell the truth about what was really going on. So he wrote all this other stuff, you know, but that's what happens in history. Whoever, whoever wins, right. in the, in, you know, gets to, gets to write the story. By the victors, that is, yeah. that's uh, an old thing. It is, it is, you know, perfectly true. Well, you've had a pretty victorious life. I mean, you figure you went through the whole rock star era. Thank God you didn't go the way of the late, Hutchins in terms of drugs and then how did you avoid how did you not fall into the trap that takes so many rock stars well yeah i mean i i honestly believe well first of all thank god yeah oh. but 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 I, but I do yeah so but i was going to say i also agree that you know you you are you are responsible for what you do you know uh, all of us are, you know, and for me, I began to recognize that the lifestyle that I was living out of suitcases and concrete hotel rooms and, you know, we worked in 52 countries as a band and that can be a bit destabilizing. You know, I, I remember watching the documentary, The Last Waltz by the, by, you know, with Robbie Robertson and Levon Helm and those guys. And I'm a big fan of that, that film too. But um, they were talking about life on the road. Yeah, it can, it can do funny things to your head, that lifestyle. And that was one of the reasons why I got into agriculture, because I recognized that the land or the earth or nature is more powerful than we are. You know, it's much more powerful than we are. And once you recognize that and you go with, my, with, with nature and you, you, you don't fight it, you, you, you just try to work out how to manage it and, 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 and cope with whatever it's throwing at you, everything else in life becomes quite simple to understand. Mm. Now, I would love to ask you so many more questions, but I know you have other interviews to do and I'm, I'm taking your time, but I do want to know, oh, almost sort of the reverse. I mean, there it was, you were on this merry-go-round of touring and that life. Now you've had a year of pandemic all over the world. Are you planning, how are you going to promote this new Andrew Farris record? Are you, do you have dates signed up in 21, 22? What? Well, my master plan was to talk to Soul. Okay. There you go. Then you're, you're done. Now you're, you're going to sell 12 million copies. You're fantastic. But, but beyond that. <laughs> oh, no, I, I know. I know. I'm, I'm sorry. Look, you no, know, I'm just, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that um, I, you know, I, I've been talking to folks and I've been really pleased and, and uh, like genuinely excited because I've had some really good reviews on my record and, you know, um, and not just well not just in australia but in in, in the uk and um canada and the us now and but you know, i meant four days getting back on the road yeah, to, I, know, oh, I know yeah but yeah. but 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 i'm saying that one helps the other and as we work out more and more how we can help each other through this pandemic nightmare bizarre thing that we're affected by that you know if people care about andrew farris's album i'm a lucky guy like that right there is a good plan you know, uh, to be happy to me is a good plan, you know, um, and I'm happy that people like my album. So if I keep can keep my health together and help those people around me to keep their health together and their lives together, when we work out as a world how to deal with this crazy world, then maybe people might want to see me play some music.
I'm sure they would. Last question for the wonderful Andrew Farris. And by the way, get his album. BMG is the distributor, I believe, all over yeah. the world. And you can get it in all the usual, the, the online audio places and vinyl. It's on vinyl. So uh, if you were to give advice to a young, nascent, burgeoning songwriter even, what might that advice be? Uh, don't follow trains or trends, okay? Just be original and if think of it like a train that's pulling into the station, okay? If you chase the train, it's too late. It's already left the station. And everything that you do will be a derivative of what someone else has already spearheaded. You're much better off to be completely original. It sounds risky or even commercially stupid, but it makes a lot of sense down the track, if you'll pardon the pun, because eventually someone will say, that person or those persons started a new train. And that's right where you want to be. Especially if, as a recording artist, you have a good engineer. <laughs> There's a little train. Yes. There, I, I apologize That's for right, that. Yeah. Woo, right. woo. I will let you. I hate letting you go, but I know you have to go. But Andrew Farris, it has been lovely talking with you. I wish you, first of all, of course, good health coming up, more music coming up, and just good life to you. Thank you, sir. And so, and uh, bon chance, as the French say. Well, 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 bon mer to you, too. <laughs> and shalom to you. Yeah, all right, my friend. Bye. You take care now. You right. too. Shalom. Behave yourself. Okay. Eh, sometimes. <laughs>